boss Pokemon have become somewhat of a new staple in the franchise, and sometimes they have unique forms like in the case of the Noble Pokemon from Legends Arceus. So in the Pokemon region I have been making Devar, I wanted to implement that same kind of mechanic, because I think they're a fun and somewhat challenging alternative to gyms. As we discussed in the last video where we talked about the legendary Pokemon of Devar, in the Uncovering the Ancient storyline you would go to different temples around the region with one of your rivals Perina, trying to collect information on the legends. Each temple you would visit has its own boss, and they are the protectors of the sacred information you are looking to discover. To get access to this info, you will have to prove your worth through glorious battle. But who are these bosses? Let's meet them. First up is one you have already met if you've been following this series, Gargoyle, who I worked with Tubbs AZ on. This rock dragon type would serve as the boss of a secret temple, which is hidden within the cave found near the base of the Barpiswar mountain range. Each boss would have two phases similar to how they operate in Scarlet and Violet. The first phase would be their standard, slightly enlarged form. But then, in the second phase, they would Spearize, the battle gimmick of the Devar region. Go see that video on the legendaries I just mentioned to see a little bit more about that. But here is Spearizen Gargoyle, who Fungusman actually handled. For a quick explanation of how Spearize works, every Spearizen Pokemon's attacks will be super effective against its opponent. Now I know that sounds a bit broken, but to balance it out, it itself is weak to every type of attack as well. It effectively turns every Pokemon into the ultimate glass cannon. It can be used by all Pokemon, but some Pokemon get special forms, much like G-Max. Anyway, Spearizen Gargoyle further taps into its Gargoyle inspiration, and showcases its partial dragon typing, gaining a longer snout with a new horn, actual wings so it can fly for some extra mobility, and overall just looking like a complete menace. This form also taps a bit more into the chimeric nature of its other inspiration, the Makara, being a mix between an elephant, fish, and sometimes a peacock, with that trunk-like snout on full display. I said Gargoyle here is first up, but that doesn't mean there's an order to each boss. You can tackle them in any order and they will level scale, though they will be set to a level 25 minimum, so you will probably need a couple badges under your belt before taking them on. Or you could just cheese it, like the Salt Cure strat. I don't know, I'm not your mom. And how exactly will you get to each of these temples? Well, with the trusty, new and improved Rotom Bike Plus, which Malmastex helped bring to life. This would essentially serve as your Coridon or Maridon equivalent, being able to swim, climb, and even fly with this bad boy. You would get upgrades as you progress through the different storylines. So let's take that bike and ride it down to the Rahasha jungle where we'll find another hidden temple deep within its vine-ridden bowels. Olmec, eat your heart out. The guardian of this temple and the bosses for the rest of this video are Pokemon not yet introduced in this series. So before we get into this temple's boss, let's take a look at its first stage. Meet Sivolt, the jittery Pokemon, a grass electric type, who I worked with Trevenart and Fungusman to create. This little restless Pokemon is based on the Asian Palm Civet, which can be found all across India and most of Southeast Asia. This adorable creature, as its name suggests, spends a lot of time in the trees, which makes for a great grass type. And some of you may already know where its electric type comes in. The Asian Palm Civet is well known for its use in making a special kind of coffee called Kopi Luwak, where the civet is fed and partially digests coffee cherries before defecating them for use. I hope you weren't eating or drinking coffee there. So Sivolt is a super caffeinated civet that gets extreme amounts of energy from the berries it consumes, getting abilities like Harvest, Ripen, and even a new move called Caffeinate, where it consumes the berry it is holding. And in addition to the berry's effects, it will raise Sivolt's special attack and speed, basically like stuffed cheeks. Citrus or Pattaya berries could go pretty crazy with this move. After reaching level 25 and using Caffeinate 20 times, Sivolt evolves into Bintattery, the exhausted Pokemon. What happens when you drink too much caffeine over an extended period of time? You crash and probably become caffeine addicted, where it has less of an effect. I'm speaking from personal experience here. This scrungly guy is based on the Binturong, another Viverid found in Southeast Asia, which are also sometimes used to make Kopi Luwak. And that can be seen in Bintattery, with its toes looking like little coffee beans, giving toe beans a whole new meaning. Binturongs are also known to emit an odor that smells like popcorn, so Bintattery would smell like coffee. But Binturongs just look like they're so done with your crap at all times, much the same as Bentattery. This Pokemon is grumpy, becoming slower and more sluggish than its previous stage. Caffeinate doesn't even work on it anymore because of its new ability called Caffeinism, absorbing any stat changes on the field to try and gain some kind of energy, but ultimately nullifying them for both you and for your opponent. So you can't set up, but neither can your opponent. It's a real double-edged sword. It's pretty much like neutralizing gas, but for stat changes. Bintattery's name comes from Binturong and Battery, but in the middle of its name is Tatter, as in how tattered looking this big old curmudgeon is. But things flip on their head again when Bintattery spearizes. 
It has gone full Super Saiyan, with Spear Eye's energy flowing through it, removing all its ailments and granting it the energy from its previous stage it so longs for. A true awakening in every sense of the word. While Spear Eye's forms already stick to one main color for their design, it can also be used with Bentatteries to reference Blonde Roast Coffee. From there, we'll head northwest and make our way up to the town of Sonindir, which is based on the town of Amritsar, with its famous Golden Temple, one of the holiest sites for Sikhs, being what our next temple is based on. Moving from two secret temples to a very much known temple, the residents of this temple protect the information held within it, while using it as a hub for the community to meet, converse, and eat together, much like the actual Golden Temple. But within its depths is a boss Pokémon that the Temple Guardians raise and train as a part of tradition. But let's meet its base stage first. So here is Aoma, the golden Pokemon, a pure water type, who I also worked with Punguzman to create. It is based on an interesting kind of fish called the Golden Masier, which has very striking shimmery scales that shine like gold, as its name implies. And what better Pokemon to reside and be trained in a golden temple? Aoma's name comes from Masier, but also AU, as in the symbol for gold on the periodic table of elements. While Aoma acts as the standard fish Pokemon you could find all over the region, the largest and strongest population of them live in the lake surrounding Sonindir, said to be the direct descendants of the very first temple boss. And speaking of, let's evolve Alma into this Pokemon. So at level 24, it becomes Sahauma, the Merfolk Pokemon, a water steel type. That's right, we got a reverse Merfolk on our hands. While we have mermaid-esque Pokemon with pre-marina and even the mermaids in the anime with Misty's performance, we haven't actually had a full-on half-fish, half-human Pokemon yet. Sahama gets its name from the Sahagin, which originated as a fishman monster of the deep in Dungeons & Dragons, and later became well-known as an enemy race in the Final Fantasy game series, with Sahama taking more from its Final Fantasy XI incarnation. While I love making Pokemon based on my nerdy interests, there is a connection to India here, with the incarnation of Vishnu called Matsya, which appears as a giant fish with a horn in some depictions, but in others as a half-man, half-fish, sometimes even as what looks like a man being eaten by a fish, which you can actually see referenced in the pattern around Sahauma's waist, along with its pose, a clever addition Fungus made. Now let's spear eyes. In this form, it channels one of the tales about Matsya found in the Mahabharata, in which he, with the assistance of a serpent, helped a man named Manu and seven sages survive a great flood by pulling their boat and defeating a demon in the process. In the story, the boat is tied to Matsya's horn, so in Sahama's spirizen form, its horn becomes the boat. Well, at least boat-shaped. All the while referencing the use of mermaids as figureheads of ships. It also loses its legs, which falls more in line with Matsya's usual depictions, but also references the serpent behind Matsya in the tale. Pun intended. From there, we ride on down southwest of Mahandaya to the Kasalani Temple, which is based on the incredibly unique Kailasa Temple and Ellora Caves found in the state of Maharashtra. This is likely the temple most players would try to take on first, with it being so close in proximity to your home, and a plethora of gems to help raise your levels a bit. Anyway, let's introduce the base stage of this temple's boss, Balome, the Dig Bear Pokemon, a pure ground type. This little cutie is based on sloth bear cubs, and is an addition to the group of adorable little bear Pokemon like Teddy Ursa, Cub Chew, and Pancham. Its name comes from Balu, the Hindi word for bear, and Loam, which pertains to fertile soil. Gen 3 stands will know what I'm talking about. Sloth bears have unique claws perfectly equipped for digging up anthills and termite mounds, which are a large part of their diet. Their noses are also specially adapted to close up so they can suck up bugs like a vacuum. And these abilities are even further accentuated when Balom evolves into... Terra Bear, the Big Dig Pokemon. While its name might reek of Talonflame-itis, it is actually meant to sound like terrible, as in how destructive this Pokemon can be with those BIG MEATY CLAWS! Both its mouth and claws are meant to evoke the feeling of construction equipment, with Terra Bear being able to dig straight through a mountain. These holes are sometimes used to create train tunnels. As you can no doubt tell, this guy has also become one with the anthill, with it having a crown that looks like one and a necklace that mirrors what the inside of an anthill looks like. This earth-encrusted bling isn't just a reference to the Sloth Bear's dietary choices. It also makes reference to the King of Bears found across both the Ramayan and the Mahabharata, Jambavan, which can also be seen in the pant-like pattern on Terra Bear. Both the Jambavan reference and Terra Bear's destructive potential are even furthered when it spearizes. Spearizen and Terra Bear's claws are now even longer and better for digging, and its body has become one giant termite or anthill. It also takes on a more ferocious style of fighting, which sloth bears are known for their aggressiveness towards humans. And those claws don't just tear up the ground, earning it a reputation as the world's deadliest bear. Jambavan was also known as a fast and ferocious fighter, taking on Lord Krishna in a fight that lasted about 28 days. 
Now let's head west of the town of Chittanagri to this small temple which is mostly ruins, based on the royal ruins of Chetedi. In this small set of ruins you can find lots of the pre-evolution to the boss Pokemon here, which are Massbine, the spiky Pokemon, a pure steel type, who I worked with an artist astray to create. This prickly pal has a fairly simple inspiration and overall concept. It is based on the Indian spiny-tailed lizard, though instead of the spines being on its tail, they go up its spine, which of course is where it gets part of its name. The other part of its name I will explain in its evolution, Mastix, the mace Pokemon. This line gets its name from the genus of most spiny-tailed lizards, Uromastix. Though Mastix is spelled like stick, as in to push a sharp object through something. Though your attention is probably more drawn to this Pokemon's tail, from which it gets its category. This mace and this line's steel typing are not only related because, you know, maces are typically made of metal, but also refers to one of the Pandavas, the central characters of the Mahabharata, Bhima. He is known to use a mace, though it is not actually as spiky as its European counterpart. There are many attempts on Bima's life. One such attempt was him being tied up, poisoned, and thrown into a lake. Well, this lake so happened to be the home of the Nagas, who tried to bite him, barely breaching his iron-like skin enough to get their venom in, which counteracted the poison he had consumed. In awe of his strength, the Naga brought him to their king Vasuki, who had him drink a special elixir that made him super strong and immune to all venom. And what is immune to the poison type? Steel. And so it all comes together in this intimidating and strong Pokemon which becomes even more strong and intimidating when it spearizes, becoming bipedal and using its severed tail as a weapon, which of course refers to how some lizards can detach and regrow their tails. Though from what I understand, spiny-tailed lizards can't actually do that, but hey, it's a fun reference. This Pokemon's general shape, jawline, and overall vibe are all inspired by the infamous king of the Koopas, Bowser. This wouldn't be the first time Pokemon has made a Mario reference, and the concept felt very fitting while mixing in elements of the bulky Bima and his mace. And for the final temple and boss, we head directly north to a temple based on the Bangar Fort, one of the most haunted places in all of India. So naturally, the boss of this temple should be a ghost type. And much like the last temple, it will have much of its pre-evolutions hanging about. So let's meet Pangost, the Pangolin Pokemon, a pure ghost type. Its category says it all. This Pokemon is based on the endearingly unique animal called the Pangolin. The reason for its ghost typing I'm going to give a bit of a trigger warning for. If you are sensitive to things dealing with animals being hurt, skip to this timestamp here. So Pangos Ghost Typing, much in the same vein as Cursula with its environmental impact basis, has to do with the fact that Pangolin are the most heavily trafficked animal in the world. I won't show it here, but Pangos' white body is reflective of how these animals look after being descaled. It is incredibly tragic, and these are some absolutely amazing animals that don't deserve this treatment. I made this Pokemon line because I wanted to bring awareness to this cause. If you want to help, there are resources like SavePangolins.org that champion funds to preserve these fantastic creatures, which you can find linked in the description or in this card here. Back to Pangost, it now has this ghostly miasma of scales, referring to a phantom limb, the sensation of a body part existing despite the fact someone may not have it anymore. I wanted to channel the same energy as Galarian Corsola with this design, this absolutely adorable creature that looks just so sad to be a ghost. On a much happier note, one of the largest recorded pangolins is actually named Ghost, which its typing is a reference to. Pangost evolves though, not quite into our boss Pokemon yet, but into its middle stage, Pangool, the ghoulish Pokemon. The miasma-like scales of Pangost have become a bit more solid, becoming more armor-like. Its claws are much longer to the point where they point backwards. While Pangolin's claws do typically point backwards, in combination with this Pokemon's type, it acts as a reference to a special kind of zombie-like creature from Bengali culture called a boot. Boots usually have some kind of unresolved matter or improper funeral that keeps them on our plane of existence, and are characterized as having feet that face backwards and some features that are upside down. And finally, Pangul evolves into our boss Pokemon, Pangrudge, the revenge Pokemon. Pangul actually evolves into Pangrudge in a bit of a unique way. This Pokemon has to have absolutely zero in the friendship stat for it to be able to evolve. It must be so consumed by hatred that it is able to unlock this form. A full Sith moment. Pangrudge, as its name and category implies, seeks revenge on those who bring about their base stage's existence. Now in its final stage, it has fully hardened armor, made from concentrated paranormal energy. The transformation of this armor across this line is inspired by a legend or cryptid found in the Chitor Fort of Rajasthan called the Abang Aku. It is said to reside at the bottom of the Tower of Victory that is in the fort, and that only the enlightened or pure of heart can reach the top. 
As one climbs the tower, the Abangaku follows behind, slowly changing colors with its body becoming more solid the higher the person climbs. When someone reaches the top, the creature reaches enlightenment, which is a perfect segue into Pangrudge's Spear Risen form. As Purina said in that previous video, this is a weird one. Pangrudge, having Spear Risen, releases the shackles of revenge, and its armor-like body becomes soft and melty. This refers to how after enlightenment, the Abangaku will sometimes return back to the bottom of the stairs and resume its old non-solid shape. So this form is a full circle moment for the entire line. And those are the boss Pokemon and their Spear Risen forms. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you guys next time.